This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. There's an old Scottish legend which is called the key to the vaults. And in this legend, the story goes like this. A shepherd boy who was tending sheep on the mountainside once saw a strange flower one day. And it was a flower like he had never seen before. A beautiful flower. He sat down by it to examine it more closely. And then he dug up the flower, root and all. It was so beautiful that he lovingly cupped it in his hands. And as he did, the great rock mountain in front of him rolled back its doors as if they were on oiled hinges, and there opened before him the vaults of the mountains. The sun shone in on untold riches. He looked in beautiful sapphires, diamonds, rubies, and gold. Awed and astonished, the shepherd boy carefully entered that cave very slowly, step by step. As he looked around, he saw wealth everywhere. He laid down the flower and picked up a few of the most beautiful stones. Then he filled his arms with the treasures. He started to leave. But then he heard a voice from somewhere say, Don't forget the best. Don't forget the best. He stopped and looked around at the piles of jewels he had left and wondered if the things he had chosen were the best stones, diamonds, jewels. So setting aside some that he had chosen and picking up others, the boy started out of the cave once again, but for a second time he heard the same voice say, don't forget the best, don't forget the best. He hesitated for a moment and then he walked outside into the sunlight When he stood there, looking at the dazzling beauty of the gems in his hands, he heard a great noise behind him. It was the great doors of the mountain shutting behind him. Suddenly, there was nothing in his hands but dirt. Once again, the voice spoke. This time it said, The key, the beautiful flower, is forever locked up in the vault. Just a legend. But with this legend in mind, listen to the words of a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and also part of a psalm. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And in Psalm 50, verse 15, God says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. Look with me for just a few moments very closely at these statements. To whom were they spoken? Is our Lord saying to everyone in the whole world, Ask, and it shall be given you, or call upon me, I will deliver thee? Are these words given to everyone as a wholesale promise to people who shut him out? and live as if they did not know God? Can just anyone lift these two promises out of the scripture and use them as blank checks to draw on the bank of God's great riches? The answer is an emphatic no. Each one of these promises has a condition attached to it. First, the the verse from Matthew 7, 7 is preceded by several verses by command from Jesus. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In that second verse from Psalm 50, verse 15, that is immediately preceded by the 14th verse, which says, Offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. <clears throat> and so in reality, we have in these two verses why what might well be called the key to deliverance. I'd like for us to keep in mind the words of Jesus when he spoke, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But I want us to spend the rest of our time this morning on the 14th verse of that 50th Psalm. Offer unto God 
thanksgiving. <clears throat> Another translation renders that verse, make thanksgiving your offering. It seems to me that God is saying here that he doesn't really want primarily our strictness in following certain forms of worship. He's not even interested mainly in offerings that we give because all these things are his to begin with. God does not ask us to give in order to get the gift from us. It's already his. Perhaps a passage of scripture that comes to, uh, to mind by hearing the words of paraphrase of, of Kenneth Taylor. Let me read it in, the, in the, the Living Bible, Psalm 50, verses 7 through 14. God says, O oh, my people, listen, for I am your God. Listen, here are my charges against you. I have no complaint about the sacrifices you bring to my altar, for you bring them regularly. But it is not sacrificial bullocks and goats that I really want from you. For all the animals of the field and the forest are mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, and all the birds on the mountains. If I were hungry, I would not mention it to you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. No, I don't need your sacrifices of flesh and blood. What I want from you is your true thanks. Such pointed words from God. There's another verse almost like this from the 100th Psalm, which says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Do we always come to God's house with the spirit of thanksgiving? Or is it possible that we sometimes come with a spirit of fretting, rebelliousness, duty, or maybe for some other reason? There's some people who come regularly to a worship service, such as we're in here this morning, and then they go away just as cold and untouched by God's spirit as they can possibly be. Why is this? I think one strong reason is because we just cannot worship God unless there is true gratitude in our hearts. Dr. Howard Kelly, one of the great Christian physicians of Baltimore many years ago, told a story which illustrates this truth so beautifully. Let me tell it in his words, if I may. The doctor said, in my hospital, I had a nurse in training who was a lovely young lady, beautiful of face, pure in heart. She was a happy Christian who adorned the gospel of Christ. Every patient who came under her care loved her dearly. It was not only the patients, but also one of, her, one of the finest young doctors in our hospital who fell deeply in love with her. They planned to be married when she finished her training. They say all the world loves a lover. Everybody seemed to love these two when they were seen often talking in the corridors of the hospital. And just after she graduated from nurse's training, these two were married. This couple lived in complete contentment and happiness for a little over a year. But then one day they brought the young doctor into the hospital with an incurable disease. It broke everybody's heart. But his wife remained faithfully at his bedside. She nursed him with loving affection until the Lord took him home. Dr. Kelly said that about a month later, this nurse came back to work on the staff at the hospital. But for some time, Dr. Kelly said he dodged her. He said, I knew anything I tr would try to say to comfort her would do no good. I stayed away from her, but I really suffered with her. And then one day, the inevitable happened, and the two of them came face to face, Dr. Kelly and this beautiful young nurse, so recently widowed. She slipped her arm through the arm of the doctor, and she said, Doc, you've been dodging me, haven't you? He replied, well, yes, I have. I didn't know what to say to you. I couldn't think of anything to say that would help heal your broken heart. And to this doctor's amazement, she just stood there, smiling. And then she said, Dr. Kelly, I have no bitterness in my heart. I'm very grateful to God. God gave me more than he gave any other woman. He gave me two years, two beautiful years, the one before we were married and the one after we were married. I had the love of the finest man who ever lived for two whole years. Dr. Kelly, you're all wrong. You don't need to say a word. 
I say a prayer of thanksgiving every day for God's blessing to me. But I think there's a second part of that 50th Psalm, verse 14, and it's this. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. Have you ever promised God something in the quiet hour of deep consecration that when you drew close to God and and God was so close to you, there was that time when you felt especially close to the Lord. may have been in a church setting during a worship service such as this, or may have been during the listening to some great music that has lifted your soul, made you want to be closer than you've ever been before to the Lord. It may be that it was not in any formal setting of worship at all. Maybe it was while you were out in the midst of the beauty of God's nature, down on the beach, or all alone, or in the silence of the woods, or even in your automobile, or in some other place. Maybe your promise to God was made as you found yourself in the midst of some great trial which faced you, or one whom you loved. Whatever it was, you said, God, I'm not happy with the way things are. I know I need to come closer to you. I need to be more faithful to your church. I need to start being a better steward of what you've given me. I need to forsake what I know is wrong in my life. I really need a new beginning. And so you prayed, Lord, if you'll just forgive me once more, if you'll help me in this situation, then I'll make a vow to you that and you fill in whatever it was you promised. Okay, have you kept your promise? Have you paid your vows to him? The psalmist says that we cannot expect to have an assurance of deliverance unless we offer thanksgiving and pay our vows unto the Most High. He doesn't say we're to do one or the other. It's both. Dr. Roy Angel tells of a former deacon in one of his churches whose first name was Walter. He was one of the finest, one of the best. He never turned down any job in the church that was offered to him. His standard reply when he was asked to serve was, I'll do it if I can. One day a man was needed to be the chairman of a certain program in the church. The pastors were reluctant to ask Walter to do it because this man was already overworked. But it was the decision to ask him anyway. And so back came the answer, I'll do it if I can. Walter then asked the preacher to tell him about the job. The preacher said, Walter, I want you to tell me something first. You've never in your life refused to do anything we've ever asked you to do here in our church. What happened? Why are you like that? What what happened to make you like that? Walter replied, Preacher, you got it right. Something did happen to make me like that. One day my little girl for whom you performed a wedding ceremony recently, was very ill. It was when she was 12 years old. The doctor walked out of her room one night and he said, Walter, we've done all we can do. She's in the hands of God. Her fever's even above 105. And after a moment, the doctor asked, Walter, can you pray? He replied that he could. So he said, My wife and I went outside and sat down on the steps of the hospital. We thanked God for our little girl. We thanked him for the happiness and the joy that this, our only child, had brought us for these 12 years. We told him that there'd be no resentment in our hearts if he took her. And then he added, but God, if you'll let us keep her, you can call on me for anything in this world, and I promise you I'll do it. Walter then explained to his pastor, I know you really can't bargain with God. And I wasn't really trying to bargain because I didn't have anything to bargain with. But I was just promising God something. So preacher, when you all ask me to do something, all I can say is, I'll do it if I can. You see, I'm just keeping my commitment. And I get a lot of pleasure out of doing that. Suppose you suddenly came face to face with some great trial or crisis in your life. What would your prayer have to be? Does it take something like that to get us on our knees before God? God says, I want your promises fulfilled. 
And the reason why he wants us to keep our promises to him is not in order for him to get something from us, but rather in order to give something to us. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. The main purpose behind both of these ideas is so that God can do what he says in Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God is saying to us, I want you to trust me in your time of trouble so I can rescue you. Then you can give me glory. Haven't we all seen those times uh, when we know what this verse says? There have been times in our own church family when we've lost loved ones. We have seen even closest members of the family found this to be true. How can those who are not Christians ever face trouble or hardship or grief? I, I don't understand how they can do that. 55 years ago, there was an avalanche that hit a little community in Wales and it buried 18 children under, under tons of cold slag. Among the children killed was the nine-year-old son of the pastor of the of Zion Baptist Church in that little village. When the initial shock was over, some of the people in the community became bitter, expressing their anger at circumstances which led to that catastrophe. But the pastor who lost his little son, along with several other Christians, took a different view we must not be bitter, he said, but we must approach this disaster in a spirit of love. And one news account of all that story said it was chiefly among the unchurched that the bitterness was being expressed. Those church people have taken it in a wonderful spirit without bitterness. As we go through these days ahead, we don't know what each day holds. The Bible says we know not what a day may bring forth. But our Lord Jesus would come to us and he would say, don't forget the best. What is that best? I think it's three things. One, offer unto God thanksgiving. Two, pay thy vows unto the Most High. And three, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. Perhaps all I've been saying this morning can be summed up in the words of the 91st Psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Yes, this is the key to deliverance. Oh God, we have no words adequate to thank you for the fact that you're always with us, not only in the good times, but when difficult times come our way. Help us, Lord, to rest in that promise of your nearness. We pray in the name of Jesus, our constant companion. Amen.